Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Ferrero. I'm the executive director at the Fund for Investigative Journalism, and we are delighted to be offering this webinar today in partnership with our colleagues at the Institute for Nonprofit News, INN. This session over the next hour, we're going to be talking about how to develop and manage collaborative investigations. And we have two of the best in the business, two people who have done this really, really well, working with a range of freelancers and different types of news organizations to share some of their experience and resources and tips with you. Um, today, you're gonna be hearing from Bridget Forson, who is the Director of Collaborations at INN. And so she's really deeply engaged in managing this work, putting together really effective uh, collaborative journalism projects and managing them. Um, and we're also gonna be hearing today from Diana Hunt, who is a senior editor at ICT, also known as Indian Country Today, and also a member of our board of directors at the Fund for Investigative Journalism. And she has built and managed and been part of uh, leading collaborations of different kinds as well. And so uh, each of them is gonna walk through some of their experience and resources and tips for you. Uh, and then at the end, we're gonna get to your questions and answer all of those. So as we go, you can ask your questions in the chat anytime. You can use either the chat or the Q&A, doesn't really matter, we'll get to them either way, but we're not gonna uh, get to them in real time. We're gonna sort of come to them at the end. So ask them anytime you'd like, and then we'll answer them after the presentation section. Um, also, uh, early next week, we'll send out an email to everybody who registered for this webinar with the full recording of today's session, as well as uh, the links and resources that Bridget and Diana uh, both shared during the session. So without further ado, uh, and with great thanks, I'm going to turn this over to our friend and partner, Brid Bridget Thorson from INN. Hi, thank you so much, Eric. I'm delighted to be invited to be with you here today um, and to be talking to you about how we look at putting together collaborative projects that really allow every participating newsroom to shine and to achieve the goals that they're looking to achieve. Um, I'd love to start with a quick level setting question um, and please feel free to respond in the chat. Um, I'd love to hear from the outlets who are here and I'm delighted to see some familiar names and some new names. Um, what's your level of experience actually creating collaborations either at your organization or at previous organizations? So give me a one if it's like, I've really never done this process before. A two if maybe you've been involved in some projects, but you're, you're looking to get even better at how you approach this work. Or a three for my collaboration gurus out there who are like, I got this down. I know exactly what I'm doing. So please pop in the chat from level of one to three, sort of your level of experience with collaborations. Um, I uh, manage collaborations for the Institute for Nonprofit News. Uh, right before that, I was at Harkins. So between those two um, positions, I work with 123 news outlets now on their audience engagement and collaboration strategies. Um, and I'll tell you from those 123 newsrooms, um, everyone is figuring this out. <laughs> We're all building it as we go. Um, and you'll be hearing a little bit later from Diana about a collaboration she and I managed last year um, and sort of what we learned from that process in terms of best practices. Um, so here's the overview real briefly for what I'm going to be talking about today, um, how you define collaborations, because I find there's as many definitions as there are to collaborations happening in journalism. Um, then we'll, we'll dig into, okay, if you want to collaborate, how do you go about doing that, right? Who do you find a partner with? How do you identify what you're going to work on? Um, getting through the MOU process and then what to do when, and there will be some challenges that come up when there's trouble. Uh, and then next we'll talk a little bit about managing the process, roles that we have found really helpful for collaborations, including the roles that Diana and I had for our collaboration last year, project management fun, um, I hope I've got some fellow project management nerds in the house. Um, and then finally, um, we'll be handing things over to Diana and she'll be able to address the wonderful work that ICT has done in this arena um, and also how freelancers fit into this. 
All right, so I'd love to, oh yeah, Q&A. Thank you, Eric. All right, so I'd love to see. Eric, what's coming in the Q&A? Are we getting like ones and twos or twos and threes? Yeah, sorry for this, everybody. We had a little bit of a tech issue trying to use chat for this. So I asked folks to do it in um, Q&A instead. I'll and we have, we have a mix, we have mainly twos um, and then a handful of ones and a handful of threes. Um, Fabulous. Okay, we're great. Getting more ones in now, so mainly ones and twos. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Whatever level you're at, I hope today is valuable for you and looking at what these best practices can be. Um, and also, if it's if it's okay to have people type in the Q and A, Eric, love to hear people who have their own suggestions for how they've managed collaborations and helpful tips too. I think we're all in this room together. We can all benefit from each other's expertise. Um, so I'll just start by talking about how we at INN define collaboration. Really, we're looking at work that makes reporting possible that wouldn't otherwise happen, right? So by coming together, you're able to share skills and resources to make reporting happen that just would not be possible otherwise by connecting to each other. And this is really crucial for me because a lot of times you see a model where there's maybe one sort of lead outlet that's telling the other outlets what to do and there's republication and that's fine. But when I'm talking about collaboration, I'm really looking at what can we achieve collectively that cannot be done individually. And for investigations, of course, data and that type of work can be a really significant area to explore. And so there's this wonderful framework. You're going to hear me refer a lot to the Center for Collaborative Journalism today because they've done a lot of wonderful research and modeling in this area, just thinking about what collaborations are. So I'm just gonna real briefly give an overview of how we think about different types of collaborations. Any and all of these can be appropriate for your work. It's really based on the goals you're trying to achieve. So there's two major distinctions that they've laid out here. Is this a temporary collaboration or is it ongoing or open-ended, right? And that's going to change how you approach that. And then there are the way that the participants in this collaboration approach the work. If you're creating the content separately and then republishing, we call that separate, whether it's a temporary project or an ongoing project. If the participants are actively working together to create content, which is what happened with the project Diana and I ran last year, then you're co-creating. And then the deepest level of collaboration is this level where the participants are not only sharing content, but they're sharing data, they're sharing resources, maybe even at the organizational level, like they're really coming together in a deep and meaningful way to make sure that everyone has the support they need. None of these is better than anybody, any other type of project. Again, it really depends on the role you're trying to play. Um, but I'd love you to just, you know, look at the screen. I'm, I'm going to put a little more detail up on the next couple slides. You know, where, where do you see that your organization is in terms of your collaborations? Is there anything you see in terms of you would, where you would like your organization to be, right? And why? Really thinking about why we create these collaborations. So when it comes to the sort of finite reporting, this can be great for a lot of different things. This can be really good for small outlets or anyone who kind of want to dip their toe into this space. Um, this can be great if something's time sensitive, needs a quick turnaround. Um, and then also if, if you're going to be integrated, you probably want someone who has some experience with this process. You know, I always tell people, you know, this is a relationship. You're deepening this relationship over time. Feel free to start with the low hanging fruit and then work your way up to the, the big integrated project. Um, it, it can take time, but it, it develops. And then when it comes to the ongoing projects, uh, when you look at that first level that's separate, this can be great, especially if your goal is to get more reach for your reporting, um, or if it's just a really particularly tricky topic to tackle and you want lots of different expertise in the room. Co-creating might be really useful if you have similar audiences. This is a place where you might want to look at actually hiring a collaboration manager <laughs> to project manage all the work and make sure everything's coming in on time. Um, and then finally, if you're ongoing and integrated, this is where you start looking at organizations like Resolve Philly, for example, right? There's back office support. They're giving structural support to the collaborations as they move forward. So take a look at this board see where you think you fit or you would like to fit. For the purposes of today, when we're talking about investigations specifically, 
I figured we'd be looking probably in this zone of temporary and co-creating and, and temporary and integrated projects. But again, it's all open. It all really depends on you and what you want to achieve. And that's that's a theme you're going to be hearing from me throughout <laughs> this presentation. It starts with and continues understanding your own North Star for how you're trying to go. Because the goal is not to collaborate, right? That's just the function that you're doing to achieve something. So what do you define that something that you want to achieve? And I think Sarah Hebel at Open Campus said this really well. Don't collaborate just to collaborate, right? I think especially right now, collaboration is kind of a, a buzzy word. <laughs> and you hear people saying, um, oh, we, we got to collaborate. We got to collaborate. OK, but what does that mean for you? right? Where are you, there are strengths that you could then have someone else accentuate. What are you looking to achieve? What can you make possible together that would not be possible individually? And that's really my litmus test, right? If people are coming together and telling me about a project, it's like, it sounds like you could just do that reporting on your own. Why do you want to collaborate? Like really think about where you could go. Um, so before you collaborate, I really encourage people to ask themselves some key questions um, about whether this makes sense. Because let's be honest, group projects are hard. <laughs> I don't know about anyone else, but I was in school, I hated group projects, right? There's always someone who like ghosted the group, someone who ended up doing all of the work. It takes so much longer. So before you go down this road, you gotta be really sure you've got good reasons to go down it. And so the first question I encourage people to ask is just, what are your organization's goals for this project? And a little bit later, I'll go through a rubric we've used, adapted from actually a negotiation framework to evaluate, okay, what's important to us about this project? What would collaboration achieve that would not be possible on your own? This can be a mix of internal and external outcomes. I hear a lot about the interest in reach, I hear a lot about matching resources, right? Oh man, we really could use some data visualization expertise. Yeah, Eric, no? Just give me a, a little emoji high five there. What unique Sorry. strengths, no, no, that's fine. What unique strengths would each participating outlet bring to this project? Yeah, really understanding where you have performed really well, where you have unique skills, and also recognizing maybe where you could use some help. And then finally, what concerns do you have about participating and what guardrails need to be in place? And this is where really honest, open conversations early on can save you a lot of pain and heartbreak. Again, this work is not easy. I believe in it, obviously. I think it's very worthwhile and I think it has the potential to achieve tremendous results, impact and learning for the field. But let's be honest, we all have limited resources, limited time. We've got to be really judicious about where we're putting those precious resources and be sure we have a clear sense of what we're trying to achieve. And also the courage to recognize when it's time to say no to certain opportunities because it's just not the right fit. Um, so often, you know, I worked at a daily newspaper newsroom. I've worked with a ton of journalists. We're so focused on what's right in front of us. I think it's hard to remember that there's going to be future opportunities that might be a better fit, and you'll be better equipped to address those opportunities if you pass down the ones that aren't the right fit. I want to bring us back to this board real briefly just to think about those goals and objectives and to recognize that different types of collaborations are often better suited to achieving certain goals. So while yes, reach can certainly be a benefit of collaborations writ large, um, large data projects are not gonna be appropriate for every type of collaboration, right? That's something where you really wanna have at least some integration between the participants to be able to understand how you share the data and how you push that out there. Similarly, trying to provide back office support for some a project that's gonna last a few months, that's gonna be way more effort to set up than it needs to be. So again, it just comes to thinking back to what do you want to achieve? How do you best want to go about that? Um, I'm going to plug, if you're if this is sparking any interest in you in thinking about, well, how do I go about you know, building a new partnership? What should I be asking? Again, the Center for Cooperative Media has fabulous, fabulous workbooks and guides that really bring you through this sort of step-by-step -step process 
of the questions you should be asking and sort of the checkpoints along the way. So that's the first section on defining collaboration, thinking about what it means to you. Next, you're like, okay, I know what I wanna do. I wanna collaborate, collaboration is great. What do I do to find partners, right? I hear from a lot of newsrooms who are like, we want to collaborate to achieve X, but we, we wanna find these types of newsrooms to do it. So I've provided, and Eric will share out after the call, some of the go-to places you can use to find partners. But honestly, so many times when it comes to that kind of low-hanging fruit first collaboration, it's who you run into, right? It's people talking at the bar at IRE, right? It's like, hey, I have this idea. What do you think about it? Sort of starting with your trusted advisors. And that's fine. Like that really is okay to just let it sort of organically develop. However, if you've identified, you know, what we need for this project is this type of outlet serving this type of audience or with this expertise, and you don't currently have that in your network, um, look at the Center for Cooperative Media Collaboration Database. They've got, I want to say like 170 some <laughs> collaborations on there. So these are newsrooms that already have some experience and interest in collaborating, and you can look by topic to see what they're doing. Look for journalism membership organizations, right? NAJA, AAJA, SPJ, all the acronyms, <laughs> like everybody, you know, is it something environmental? Maybe you wanna to turn to SEJ, you know, see if there are topical membership organizations that can just sort of put a call out to their members. When it comes to investigative reporting in particular, here's a couple examples. There's more of reporting networks that are specific for investigations at Reveal and ProPublica that newsrooms can join. Again, Eric's got the links to all these. Um, and then just as a little plug for INN, you can find um, there's more than 400 nonprofit newsrooms who are members of the Institute for Nonprofit News. They're all searchable in our member directory by topic, by geography, right? <laughs> you can find, you know, who you're looking for there. Um, and then I'll just share our collaborations are not limited to nonprofit newsrooms. So if you have a really legitimate like way you think you can support this collaborative work, We'd love to hear from you at INN. Just email us at collaborations at inn.org. All right, Eric, is anything urgently coming up from the chat before I move on? In the no, great, great to move on. And a reminder right. to folks who have joined us that um, you can put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them after the presentation, but feel free to ask them in the Q&A anytime. A little bit of confusion from earlier when we asked people to use the chat. Chat is not enabled, Q&A is, so you can type stuff in there. Thank you. And before I move on, Diana, I think you wanted to say a word or two about other ways you can connect with potential partners. Sure, yeah, I mean, just, I would just reach out to people you know. I mean, a lot of it is who you know. You got a friend somewhere say, hey, would you guys be interested? Maybe this would be something for you. Use all the resources, use all the connections you have and just reach out. Um, I was on a call just a couple of weeks ago with, um, I, I'm not going to share the details, but um, someone who thought their team of reporters would work well with us at, at ICT. And we, we're, we're going to circle back and see where things go from there. It was a, it was a, just an opening salvo. Hey, this would be, this would be good. I think we could make this work. Sure. Let's talk about it some more. So um, use those resources that you have. It never hurts to ask. Never hurts to ask. And it, it, it is similar to, you know, anytime you're you're developing trust in a relationship with someone, right? It just needs time. It just needs conversation. And you just, you need to go to people you trust to start with. Um, I, I highly recommend that. All right. So you have identified some partners. You're getting down to brass tacks. You are planning your collaboration. What I highly recommend you avoid <laughs> is being like, okay, we're just going to cover this, and then off you go, right? There's a whole lot more planning and logistics that needs to go into it, and it really pays off to do that up front because I have heard the horror stories of the partnerships where you get literally to the day before publication, and all of a sudden, well, who's editing this? Why did they change my story? When are we going to publish it? And like, that's not when you want these questions to come up. So if you take the time at the start of the process to think about 
the issues that are important to you, and this is that negotiation framework adaptation that I mentioned, you know, what's what's important to you to discuss, right, when it comes to what you want to achieve here? Um, what are your positions on those issues, right? Is reach your number one thing? Or are you more concerned about impact? Is it really important to you that you're reaching certain communities? Just like, where do you stand? And this is all things you can identify before you have these conversations. Um, why do you hold those positions? You know, another thing that comes up a lot in collaborations is all of a sudden you're working with these other outlets and these other partners who may not necessarily hold the same mission and values as you do. You don't want to find that out the day before publication. <laughs> you want to have that discussion early enough in the process. Now that can be a wonderful additive thing that can allow you to think about these projects and your approaches in new ways. That can also be a red flag. Right. And so you want to identify that off the start and then rank the issues. Right. What's most important to us for getting out of this project. Right. Both internally and externally. Where just can we not budge and where are we willing to have that discussion? And then also you can go through this exercise for the people you're talking to and then adjust it as you go. Right. Maybe you think the most important thing to them is um, to have a really shiny, interactive visualization at the end of the project. And you find out that actually they're desperate to test out this new method of reaching certain audiences they've been trying to reach. Right. So just have the conversation about where you want to go and understand why. Be able to articulate why. And then I'm going to say my, my very biggest piece of advice for all of these conversations, love the journalists who are willing to get the work done at any cost, but it is okay, whoops, it is okay to walk away at any point. Save yourself, right? Do the due diligence, but if, if it's just not the right fit, you are only going to spend more time and energy than you need and frankly than you can probably afford by like trying to make it the right fit. There are going to be other opportunities. So I, I can't say strongly enough, don't put yourself in that position, right? And nobody's feelings get hurt all the time. All the time I'm reaching out to newsrooms and offering them like, oh, would you like to participate in this? And they say, not right now, thanks. I say, great, thank you. You have saved us so much time and energy. I would much rather be working with the people who have the interest, the energy, the time, the resources to be there than the people who are trying to make it work and just can't cram it in. So again, it's okay to walk away. It's it's very good. In fact, you should do that often. Um, so here's an example of that same process in grid four, right? Doesn't have to be fancy. Get out a sheet of paper, get out a little spreadsheet and be like, what are your issues? What's our interest in this issue and what's our position on this issue and how important is it to us? And then do the same for the partners you're talking to. Yeah, just to see where there's alignment as you identify your collective goals for this work. Okay, you've had a lot of discussions. You're getting close. You've walked away if it's okay to walk away. <laughs> um, but if you haven't, it's now probably time to get something in writing. If you're going to engage in any project that's going to involve like a good level of effort over a reasonable period of time. You know, you don't have to do this if you're going to co-publish a story once and you already have an existing publishing time frame. But otherwise, do an MOU. Use a memorandum of understanding. Again, the Center for Cooperative Media has actual guides from newsrooms, including some specific to investigative projects that get into liability and all those issues. We, for our editorial collaborations, tend to use a pretty bare bones MOU that gets to the basics, just so it doesn't get tied up in legal stuff and everyone understands the same page. Um, and, and have that conversation. If someone's presenting you an MOU, ask them about things that you want to ask them about, right? Because this will become your template moving forward for how you can use it. So if you don't already have your own template, you can go check out collaborativejournalism.org.guides. But this is all part of the conversation. Every time I send out an MOU for a collaboration, I say, send me your questions and we make adjustments. And that's fine, because then this will become something you can refer back to when any questions arise as you go through the process. All right, so we're getting to the process now. I'm almost there. I'm almost handing out to Diana. Uh, but first, I'm going to share one of my very favorite charts. 
which is how the journey of a project feels from IDEO. And Diana and I were joking, there should be like a lower level with like an exploding head where just like you plunge into despair. But it's it's hard, right? You start out, you have all the energy and enthusiasm in the world. And then, oh my God, your freelancer had to go to um, India because her grandmother got sick, which just happened on a collaboration that I just ran. How am I going to make deadline? Right? <laughs> Things come up. Things get behind. It's not going the way you want it to. You're going to enter that, that valley of despair. But then hopefully, if you see that as insight, it builds into the confidence and you finish out strong. So I always tell people, plan for problems, right? And you can plan for problems by thinking about that future valley of despair person <laughs> um, and what they will need to know, right? Who's going to be responsible to making sure everyone's on track for deadline and deliverables? And I'll talk about project roles in a little bit, right? So that's not just sort of floating in the ether, like everyone's responsible for their own thing. How are you going to communicate? Some people don't want any more Slack workspaces, right? Is it going to be email? Are you going to have regular meetings? What's going to happen? Things are going to change. You need to be able to adapt. Um, who will arbitrate? Like when disagreements come up, Who's the decision maker? You don't want to be figuring that out in the moment. You want to have a person set aside or a function, right? Well, let's refer back to the memorandum of understanding and come to an agreement. And then finally, what processes need to be discussed? Again, matching up who, you know, when does someone get final edit? When do you publish? When do you get to the data? How will that be shared? What permissions? Like, is it exciting to talk about? No. Are you doing your future self a favor by talking about it earlier? Yes, right? So just think ahead of time, what are those things that are gonna come up? All right, so lastly, real briefly, I'll talk about actually managing this process. You've made it so far. It doesn't seem like it, but you've identified partners, you've signed memorandums of understandings, you have an idea of your goals, your positions, your issues, where you wanna go with this. Oh my God, you finally get to start the reporting, but wait, who's the project manager, right? This is the function I played in the collaboration we ran last year. It's very glamorous work. It's the person who's like, let's all get out of Zoom. <laughs> what are the deadlines? But it's very necessary work, right? Um, who's the editorial lead? And, and you can define this many different ways, but Diana was the editorial lead for our project. She did a tremendous job. She talked to all the participating newsrooms and did check-ins along the way to make sure that the coverage was coordinated and consistent. So we didn't always have to all get together on calls. Diana just kept that conversation rolling and made sure everyone was aligned with each other so we could achieve our collective goals. And then who's going to be the point person in the newsroom, right? Every participating newsroom should have someone who's able to communicate with those roles and then also bring staff into production as needed because you're going to know the production process for your newsroom better than anybody else. And then finally, what shared resources are you going to access and how, right? Could be data. We did a community engagement survey, and then I provided Diana with the data from that, and we gave it to the newsroom. You know, anything you can think of that has that sort of shared capacity, you're going to need to think about how people can access and use it. And so again, I'll point you to the Center for Cooperative Media Project Manager Playbook. You can see my job description in there. It goes through all of these things, how you manage these collaborations. All right, thank you all for sticking with me. I'm just about to hand things off to Diana. Before I do, I'll just mention, as I said, INM collaborations are open to any type of partner that will advance the mission we're working on. What we provide for these collaborations, we do framing and funding work, we do project management, like I just said, we report out impact. Basically, we want newsrooms to be able to focus on the journalism, and then we manage all the process. I will say we've been doing collaborations for years, but we are moving from that finite side of the chart to the ongoing side of the chart. Um, our first ongoing collaboration is called the Rural News Network, which is exploring rural issues across America. And we actually, like, literally just now, <laughs> announced a project we're kicking off with the Reynolds Journalism Institute to identify our next sustained topical collaboration. And we're looking for non-members to interview. So I will pop a link to the survey. If I put it in the chat, Eric, will it go somewhere or no? Yeah, I believe it will, Bridget. Okay, let's see if this works. 
Um, if not, I'll give Eric the link to share it afterwards. Yeah, um, that's probably easiest. Yep. We just we just launched this survey today. You can apply to participate. We're conducting interviews um, in March to identify, you know, where do we think there really could be value in coming together and reporting out. So again, love to hear from anybody who's interested. You can reach me at Bridget at inn.org. That's like the word bridge with a T <laughs> at inn.org. Um, and uh, with that, I will hand things over to Diana to talk about how she puts these practices into action in her work at ICT. Hi, everybody. Um, now that Bridget has laid out all the things that have to be done, I'm here to say what can work and what doesn't and what to avoid and, and what to try to do. So I'm going to run through some of the some of the collaborations that ICT has done in the last year or two years um, since I've been there. Um, the largest one by far was the collaboration with INN, which was, um, it was initially, we came in as the editorial lead and then we, then we framed the project before we pinned down the individual story. So this was, um, I think, a, a, a special kind of project because it was a 10, it was 10 different partners and we set it up so that each partner did its own story independent of the others. It was a standalone story that they could run, but it all fit into the same theme that we had ongoing for everybody. And the thing that what we decided to do was looking look at the state of the economy in Indian country. What are the jobs? Where are the jobs today? Where are the jobs tomorrow? Which jobs are likely to go away? Um, we also had um, Indian country today came in to write the overview story. So there was a story that pulled all of the pieces together that our uh, then editor, Mark Trahant wrote. And then each of these pieces um, were, were standalone stories. Indian Country Today ran them all. Um, Bridget's showing you the list of the stories and some follow-up stories that were done too. Um, we looked, we, we, we also had a, a a community engagement component that I thought was really interesting. And it was particularly difficult during COVID. So we adapted and Indian Country Today did a survey that got some really interesting responses. We got a lot of people. We had several hundred responses, representatives from more than 130 different tribal nations uh, speaking out on what, what's the best job in their area, what's the worst, which one which are the jobs of the future. Uh, green energy, renewable energy was seen as one of the jobs of the future along with healthcare, gaming and uh, oil and gas was seen as the jobs that probably will diminish over time. Uh, it all seemed very rational and, and interesting. We were pleased to have gotten those resources. Um, we looked at a number of different, uh, a number of different topics. We looked at should tribes, um, diversify beyond casinos should what does the cleanup of uranium mining mean for jobs uh, we had a, a tribe that had a sports team we had um lithium we looked at solar we had different stories we had work penalties the members were some members of inn who are nonprofit organizations and then we brought in some tribal media to to coordinate to handle their elements and to to also help um, balance out I think the you don't want a top heavy uh, collaboration it needs to be a partnership um, most recently and I'll circle back to some of these but most recently we did a collaboration with reveal which was really interesting for me I'd never really done a lot of radio podcast type things and that investigation uh, grew out of a story that our national correspondent, Marionette Pember, had been working on literally for decades, uh, the Indian boarding schools. And they wanted her expertise and credentials, frankly, in that area. And then they wanted to turn it into a podcast. So Marionette and I went through the regular reporting and write, she wrote the, the as you can see here, the, um, the lead story, the digital story version. And then we followed them along in the podcast element. It was really fascinating and uh, quite enjoyable. And I'm, I'm still impressed with how it's all done. One of the things that's really important is to make sure you have an understanding of responsibilities. And I know that Bridget went over this, but it's really important. If you're the writer, 
if you're the editor, if you're a partner, you really need to know who's doing what. Um, we we had um, a little understanding with Revealed. They were very great to work with, but their digital folks wanted final edit on the story and we absolutely refused. There's not, we're not handing off our digital story to someone else to make final decisions. No, we had the final decisions on that. And so you have to understand going in, there has to be clear a clear understanding. And so we, we edited jointly. Um, I was a, actually the first time I've ever been an associate editor on a podcast. I was listed as associate editor. Um, but we went through line by line, step by step in the script and the, in the, and we, you know, I would flag things here. Wait, wait, we don't want to say this. Wait, we want to do this. And it was a very, it was a very collaborative experience. We um, each contributed. They would say, oh, that doesn't sound good for radio. Let's do this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. So um, make sure you understand what, what the responsibilities are and then be flexible, be willing to talk with people. You can't just say, I refuse to talk about this. You want to be able to come in and, and talk about the issues and get them resolved in a way that's best for both. And then we also have done a couple of collaborations with the Center for Public Integrity. Um, we most recently did one on tax revenue, uh, tribal tax, taxation. And that was an interesting project because the Center for Public Integrity has been doing a year long project investigating tax related issues. They had one story on tribal issues and approached us and said, would you be willing to work with us on this? And we agreed. What that brought for us, for Indian Country Today, is they'd already done all the data work. They'd already gotten all those databases. They'd already done the analysis. They'd already done that part of it. But they wanted our help in humanizing it, connecting it to the people on the ground, making sure they didn't step into any unwarranted rabbit hole, uh, things like that. And so we had one of our uh, national correspondents, Jocelyn Estes, who's based in Alaska, step in and handle reporting. And then we also used a freelancer. And that freelancer was someone I had worked with previously that Indian country today worked with previously from uh, on the INN project. And uh, she's a well-known journalist. She's editor of Osage News based in Oklahoma. And she stepped in as a freelancer with Center for Public Integrity and handled, she actually produced the lead for the story. It was uh, the, the on the ground interviews that she got are what went to the top of the story because it's it connected people with what the issues were in a very real way. So um, we did that one with the Center for Public Integrity. We also worked with them in a lesser way on a uranium mining um, issue, uranium contamination story. And in that case, we didn't really, we were more of a partner that mostly involved me back reading and making suggestions and raising questions. And um, and then we agreed, we co-published the story when it went. So, and in all of these cases, we co-published. With the INN project, um, I, I think Indie Country Today is the only one that published every one of them. We agreed going in, we're gonna publish all of these. We care about all of these. Each of the other partners had the choice if they wanted to pick and choose if certain issues were relevant to them, they ran in certain ones that were not. Um, and then we had a different kind of collaboration with the Marshall Project. Um, we had an innocence case, a, a man who'd been in on death row in California for years and years, um, who had a quite active law firm that was raising new innocence issues for him. And for us, he's an indigenous man. For us, it was a, a relevant story. Um, and we started in and a, we approached the Marshall Project about it and got some really good, I have, I know people there. I have, I have a reporter who, who used to work for me in Houston who worked there and they sort of dug into it. And then they decided this is, we don't really do innocence cases. So we're going to back off on that. And so they basically did some groundwork and they handed those resources off to us and we wrote the digital story. And then they asked for um, a special story called Life Inside. It's a regular series that they do. We used a freelancer, one of our regular freelancers for, the, for those stories. And he produced the 
he did a number of interviews, phone interviews, because you got a 15 minute limit with death row. So he did interview after interview, 15 minutes at a time to do this story um, that we handed over to them and they edited. Um, and we got final say, we, we, we were able to raise questions and say, wait a minute, we don't, we don't really like the wording on that, but it, but they basically handled it. Um, so those were, two, those were two different kinds. That was sort of, I've got it down as a quasi collaboration. Um, it was more of a partnership. They shared with us, we shared with them. We both published what we needed to publish. And any country today also published the life inside story. So um, those, those are some of the collaborations that we've done that I felt like were of value to, to both partners. And then the things to look at are what are your shared strengths, data, together, what can you do? Data on the ground reporting, putting it in context. Um, for Indian country today, I think we're approached often because we have we understand the politics and the sensitivities of some of these issues that other people don't quite understand. And then what does this mean for freelancers? As a freelancer, how do I get, how do I get in one of these? Um, and th the first thing I would say is, what are your strengths? What do you have? If you have a lot of data and you've already analyzed the data and then you're looking to do something with it um, before you've reached out to find your publishing partner, which is what FIJ requires you to do for a grant, I might say, um, I would... I would encourage you to start talking with people. Is this something you might be interested in? Would you like to work that I work with you on this? Those are ways to, um, to approach things. You know, if you have the data, one of the, Indian country today has some, some limited resources at this point in some areas. And we do data, we do our own data. Um, we did some really good work before I got there on, on COVID. There just were no numbers for Indian country. And we just, got them all together to the point that Johns Hopkins took over the database we'd created and now is continuing it. So, um, but if you have the basis for a story, you have the legwork to do, uh, reach out. It may be that somebody's already working on that and your work could be added into it. It, it, it don't, don't give up just because you don't know, I would say, but I'd also say before you pitch a big pro project to somebody you've never worked with before, Go in on a something small so you can work with them to build up some trust. I mean, investigations are going to require fact checking. They're going to require a legal review. They're going to require a lot of things that are um, that are important along the way that you have to be able to understand who you're working with. You don't want to be surprised on from either from either side. Um, you don't want to get into a group that's too timid to run what you've got, but you don't want to be on the other side and say, gosh, we can't go that far. Um, we have to back, back up a little. So um, make sure when you go into it that you understand what the, what, you know, what the, what the boundaries are and make, make sure you feel comfortable with folks. And then I would say to members, if you have a project and need a freelancer, that's another good way for freelancers to get to get out there because a lot of times you need to be in a community and on the ground to personalize a story and you might not have anybody in that area or sometimes, you know, some of these in our tribal areas it is really hard to get there. You know, you got to go to South Dakota, you have to fly into Rapid City, and then you have to drive two or three or four hours, and then you have to, it's not an easy way to get there if you can find somebody who's on the ground. Um, so there are a lot, you know, reach out, get to know people, offer your services in certain ways, it might turn out that there would be something different. Um, there are also follow-ups, I would mention um, in, in the uh, INN collaboration that we did. We just recently talked with one of the partners, um, Monica Peon at um, Rawhide Press, and they're going to do a follow-up story for it that we'll run with India Country Today. It's it was the, She did the story looking at the penalties involved if you actually get a job. Sometimes you lose so many benefits by taking a low-wage job that it's harder in tribal communities to take a job than to not have a job. And it was an interesting story. It got a lot of hits on our website. And once her story came out, her tribe has um, 
decided they're going to make some changes. And so she's going to pull together a story for that. And we'll run that story as well. Um, the, we also have, you know, what, um, don't, don't give up complete control. I, mean, I, I can't say, you know, you've got, it was really important, I felt, to have an editorial lead on the INM project. It was, there were lots of different balls in the air and lots of different things going. And we needed to produce a cohesive package. But we also worked with the individual reporters. And, and frankly, every reporter I've ever worked with mostly would, would push back on edits. I mean, they, I don't I expect the pushback on edits. Um, they're going to have to say, wait a minute, I like that word. And oh, don't change that. So, but, but you have to be able to work through and understand if, you know, if there's a serious difficulty, as, as Bridget said, you really can just walk away. Um, you can say, well, I think, I think this is not something I can accept and I'm going to deal with it. Um, I'm not going to name any names, um, but we're in the middle of one now where the data work is there, but the approach that's being taken on the data work is offering some concerns for us. Um, and I'm not sure where it's gonna go. Um, we've been very involved in discussions and we're talking and trying to shape the project. The shape it's taking is not something I think that we would participate in, but we don't know that yet and we're still working on it. But I don't think there would be hard feelings either way. And we'd certainly be open to a future collaboration if this one doesn't seem to work out. But um, you have to go in with the understanding that it's okay to just say, okay, nah, thanks. Thank you. We're, we're happy. You're, you can have the contributions that we made already and we're out of here. So um, don't, don't, uh, don't feel like you can't do that. You're not locking yourself into something you don't want to have your name on. Um, Let's see here. The other thing is you need to be able to, you want to be sure that you, you're you willing to adjust to. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot with reporters who are to go in and they're just locked in on something and you, you can't go in with that. You have to be able to say, okay, you know, I see this perspective, but perhaps this other perspective, perhaps this other nut graph would have a broader reach for somebody. Be open to the suggestions and and um, be willing to go back and forth. And then the result is everybody benefits. I mean, there's just no way around it. You at Indian Country Today, we get resources we wouldn't have had or we get them within a time frame that's reasonable. We don't have to wait two years to get the data back from the federal government. We don't have to wait, you know, six months for somebody to analyze the data. That's already done. That was already done for us with the Center for Public Integrity. And then we came in with um, with a different perspective, and and I thought it worked out well. That's great. Thank yeah. you so much, Diana and Bridget, mm -hmm. both for that. We have ten minutes left, and we want to make sure to get through as many of the questions as we can. We've got about 11 questions in the chat and the Q&A. People can send those in now and we'll get to them. I, I think a first one, kind of grouping a couple of these together, and you, you both sort of touched on this, um, but I think we have both a freelancer, uh, Isaiah, and, a, and an outlet, Rowan, asking a little bit about how do we know that collaborative projects are going on such that we can come into them? And you guys talked a little bit about sort of that people need to talk with their networks and things like that. This is a little bit more about, you know, things that are underway that might need people power and a freelancer might want to come in or projects underway that an outlet might bring value to. Can each of you just really briefly give any other insight or tips or suggestions that you have for both outlets and freelancers about how to learn about and then enter into some of the collaborative projects? Yeah, I can real briefly speak to the outlets. And I think this is a great question. I loved the comment about hosting an event in which potential collaborators can find partners um, or creating a database. And currently, the best way to do it is really just to reach out to your network and to try to get into the spaces where those conversations are happening. So this would include the Center for Cooperative Media. They've got a newsletter and they've got that journalism database. 
Um, I'll also say that we have aligned the uh, Center for Cooperative Media Collaborative Journalism Conference and INN Days this year. So they're both happening in the same week in uh, Washington, DC at the same location in early June. So we thought as sort of a two for one, if you wanna to go to one, you can go to the other. Um, you know, Anywhere where these conversations are happening. And then if you're a freelancer, the outlets you're working for may be interested in engaging in collaborative projects. And you can ask about that. A number of the outlets we've worked with have hired freelancers. And then as the collaboration deepens over time, those freelancers get picked up again to continue that collaborative work. Diane, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add there. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, start, working with organizations on a smaller scale and you can build into that. Um, we had known Shannon Shaw Duty, who was the, the uh, editor of Osage News, who was one of the partners in the INM project. And we had worked with her in the past. She had applied to be part of the project with INN. And then when the, when the issue came up with Center for Public Integrity, I reached out to Shannon and said, would you be interested in doing this as a freelancer? So those are past relationships and past work that builds on each other. So you may not start with the huge collaboration. You may start with something small and build from there. Great, thanks both of you. Um, Carissa King has asked about um, for-profit outlets that have paywalls partnering with nonprofit outlets that don't have similar meters and kind of how do you, how do you navigate fitting those pieces together? That's a great question. A lot of times what I'll see is the for-profit will agree not to have a paywall on the collaboration story, much as you might take down the paywall for a big weather event or election stories. Um, but that's definitely a conversation that should happen before you sign the agreement to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah, we're one of those that does not have a paywall. We're going to post it if we're if we have co-publishing rights. We're going to post it. Um, so you got to you've got to make sure that's agreed to ahead of time. Great. We also have a couple of um, folks who have been been raising different questions about global and kind of cross border collaborations, and I think you have both done some work on those. Can you talk a little bit about you know sort of you know how to how to nav how to navigate those and any of the particular uh, i think you know challenges and opportunities that those might bring up Diana you want to take that one first sure sure um we haven't done investigative we since i've been there we have not done any investigative international collaborations um we do have um it, we've got something that may be in the works, but it's not yet. Um, and so I think we're open to it. I think that the, um, I think that you, you know, make the pitch and, and bring it forward and see who might be, um, you might look at who might have covered some of these issues in the past. If you wanted to pitch one from an international perspective, um, I'd approach the people who have been covering those issues and see where it uh, what what the potential is. I think uh, we would be open to something. Um, we just have to be careful um, to understand the, the limitations of whatever country these are involved in. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that real quickly, if I might, Eric, um, and I'm sure FIJ has a lot of resources here, but a couple of INN members that work specifically in this space are the Center for Collaborative Investigative Journalism, and they've done projects all over the world. Um, they've invested heavily in reporting in Africa and other places, um, as well as the Global Investigative Journalism Network. Um, and so they've got a, a lot of resources and expertise, particularly in the global collaborative space. I saw someone asking about, you know, the benefits of these collaborations as well, how you approach those conversations. Um, just being aware that these conversations need to be had in terms of meeting expectations and how we'll communicate and everything else that I mean, that's more than half the battle. So just ask the questions up front and ask about what you don't know to ask about. Um, one benefit real briefly that um, I, I has frankly really surprised me with these collaborations is how much people appreciate the um, editorial lead role and being edited by someone outside their organization. I thought people would hate it. Now I'm sure with the wrong person in place, they would, but with Diana, they loved it because you're getting that expertise and you're getting that perspective that is new and allows you to grow your reporting. 
That's great. We're going to try to squeeze in two last questions in these final three minutes. One of them is really practical um, around uh, for those radical sharing collaborations. What are some of the tools that you use for encrypted communication between newsrooms is the first part of the question. And then the second is, what are some of the ways that you figure out division of labor um, issues? I, I'll go on this one. I think that um, we haven't done anything encrypted. I think when you approach someone, the understanding is, and you can say this up front, that they're not going to steal your idea and take it and run with it. Um, you know, I I would say, you know, if we could talk off the record, you know, I hope you will keep this, you know, and not share this with anyone. And you have to agree to that. And I think that's perfectly understandable if you haven't worked with somebody in the past. And then um, you you need to. Um, you know, we don't, we haven't done encryptions, we just talk. Um, and I think that that's kind of key. If you do just default to whatever is suggested, but it's, it's good again to have the conversation. Right, great. And then the last question from Natalie Abruzzo, who had some audio issues at the beginning and hung in there and got herself connected, I think on her phone. Thank you, Natalie, for being so tenacious. She asked something that I think especially for, um, a lot of the FIJ audience is really important, which is for independent journalists, freelance journalists who are trying to pivot into investigative work, um, including through collaborations. What are some best practices and tips for approaching news organizations that you don't have a relationship with and trying to make yourself known to them, trying to, to build that relationship? Yeah, I'll take this one for first. Um, I do handle most of the freelancers for Indian Country today, and I sorry the phone is ringing and it'll stop in a second. Um, the um, I think that that it's I would be I would be I'm not it's not impossible, but you need to build a relationship first before you launch something gigantic. Um, you know, let us, you know, do an, a preliminary story that might touch on the issue and say, look, this story addresses some issues, but these are some real, there's a really big investigation here that needs to be done. So I would say build relationships, build the relationships first before you drop it on somebody and ask them to take on a big project. So um, build those relationships, get to know people, spread it, spread you know, spread, spread around, spread things around a little bit and see who you like working with, who's working well with you, who you feel comfortable with. I think that works on in both sides. You don't want to get in the middle of a, of an organization that's, that's nightmarish to edit. Um, Great. Bridget. Any last, last thoughts, Bridget? I would just thank you for the invitation. Um, you can't bother me. I'm not in a working newsroom on deadline. So please truly reach out to Bridget at INN.org if you're curious about learning more about collaborations and the work we do. And again, so grateful to both Diana and Eric for the invitation here today. Yeah, thank And you're you always both. welcome. Yep. Yeah, you're welcome ahead, to reach yeah. out to me too. Um, we we don't we get we get a lot of requests, but that doesn't mean you can't send me a note and I'm happy to give you some feedback. And Diana, how do they do that? Diana, two N's, D-I-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, at ictnews.org. Wonderful. Uh, Bridget Thorson and Diana Hunt, thank you both for taking some time out of your day to really share some of the expertise and experience that you all have in developing these collaborative projects. Thank all of you for joining us and for the work that you all do. Some of you are at Outlet, some are freelancers. We're really grateful to get the chance to work with you. Um, FIJ.org has more about our grants, more about our grantees, incredible stories. INN.org has more on the incredible work that INN does for more than 400 member uh, news organizations around the country. We will uh, early next week be sending out to all of you a full recording of today's session uh, along with the links and resources that were discussed today. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Bye.